My name is Justin Gravitt. I work with Navigator Church Ministries in Dayton, Ohio. And as people are filtering in, I just want to introduce our team, uh, Navigator Church Ministries team that's here. Uh, if you were here with us for the last session, you know Roy and Margaret Fitzwater, who are the leaders of Navigator Church Ministries. So Roy and Margaret, Roy's here, Margaret's back in the back. Um, our next presenter after me, so tomorrow morning, is Callie Parkinson. Callie's with the Reveal team and helping us out. She's going to be talking about how to assess a disciple-making culture tomorrow. And then Cedric Brown uh, out of Baltimore. Cedric, can you wave? There he is. Uh, he's a regional leader out there. And he's going to be presenting on the silver bullet of spiritual growth uh, tomorrow afternoon. And then Bill Mowry uh, is in Columbus, Ohio. Bill? Uh, Bill's going to be communicating about the ways of the alongsider. That'll be our last track session. So we're glad that you're here. Um, I want to introduce myself a little more fully. Uh, my favorite people in the world are the people right there, my family. So they're the ones that sent me off. Uh, yesterday I actually traveled down. So we have three daughters and one son. Uh, my background, I've been doing work with pastors and churches for just about the past three and a half years. I've been with the Navigators vocationally for the past 17 years. And our last stop prior to this stop in Dayton was Thailand. And so if you know much about Thailand, Thailand's a matriarchal society. So when we were there, we had three daughters. Okay? Come back to the States, patriarchal society, and we finally get our son. So we are happy that all of them are, are healthy, and um, they're really excited for me to be here. Um, but they're really excited for me to get back, too. Um, one of the first things I did in Thailand was embarrass myself. So I went around saying... Hi, my urinate is Justin. (laughs) And I couldn't quite figure out why I was getting the response I was getting. It was kind of like, but the tonal language thing kind of caught up to me on that one. Um, But we're going to be talking about culture and kind of following up on what Roy and Margaret started from the last session of the importance of culture. I don't think we can overstate how important culture is. Now, my first experience outside of our culture was actually to Thailand, where I was making a fool of myself. Um, but the other things that I learned really quickly was how different culture is. I remember going to a movie theater for the first time in Thailand, and the previews were showing, and it's just like being at home. And then all of a sudden, everybody stood up. I was like, what's going on? Well, there was a homage to the king. And so it was kind of like the national anthem um, at a ball game in America. They do that at uh, movie theaters. The other thing I noticed, I went around and people would pick their nose a lot and they weren't trying to hide it or anything. So sometimes they'd pick it and then they'd put their hand out to, to greet you. And that's just not a, not a taboo thing there. So you just kind of get used to it. But that was my first experience out of the fishbowl of America. And what we're going to be looking at today is what is American culture, and how does it impact us? Because culture is one of those things that we all experience, but most of the time we don't really recognize, do we, what it is or what we're experiencing. And it makes sense. There's a quote by Marshall McLuhan, who's an author. He said this, Fish did not discover water. In fact, because they are completely immersed in it, they live unaware of its existence. Similarly, when a conduct is normalized by a dominant cultural environment, it becomes invisible. What I hope that we're going to be able to do is make the invisible visible. And what I believe about you is I believe we have a room full of people who are leaders. Some of you are pastors, some of you are elders, some of you are ministry leaders. And so I believe that if we can make some of this culture that's now invisible more visible, that we can talk together about what those implications are for our churches and for our life-on-life disciple-making relationships. And so to do that, just so you know how, how this uh, time is going to flow this, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to be taking us on a trip throughout history starting uh, around the turn of the 1900s. And then... You know, basically that's me talking, but hopefully it's really interesting. I find it really interesting. But after we orient ourselves to the forces of history and culture that are still really influencing us deeply today, then we can come together around what we've seen, 
and around what's happened and continues to happen and the forces that continue to play on us. And then we can think together about, well, what are the implications then? How might that impact you as a leader? How might that impact those of you that are in your churches and your pews? How might that impact the elders that you're trying to lead? How might that impact your families and your children? I want to start with two questions. What if the water we swim in was carefully manipulated for the benefit of others, the benefit of a few? What if the water, the cultural waters that we swim in were carefully manipulated for the benefit of a few? What if the American way was just a marketing scheme? I want you to take a trip with me to the turn of the century, and I want to anchor our story around a man named Charles Kettering. So I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I grew up hearing the name Kettering my whole life. You may have heard it if you're not from Dayton. You may have heard it from the Sloan Kettering Foundation. What's that? You grew up in Kettering. Awesome. Okay. Glad you're here. Okay. So Charles Kettering um, was born in Ohio, 1876, graduated from the Ohio State University. Had a bad week last week. We won't talk about that. Um, graduated in 1904. He was 28 years old when he graduated because of some health problems that he had previously. Immediately after graduating, he went to work in Dayton, Ohio at NCR. NCR was one of the most influential companies in all of America at that time. At one point, 20 to 25 percent of all CEOs had worked at one point at NCR. Now, Charles Kettering was an engineer, an electrical engineer, but he hung out with the salespeople because he said that's who has the pulse of the people. And so every day when he would hang out with the salespeople, he would see this sign on the wall. And this sign said, we cannot afford to have a single dissatisfied customer. It was on every wall in every sales department at NCR. And this reflected the culture of America. This reflected the, the priorities of America. Charles Kettering worked there for five years. He left in 1909 to start his own company, Delco. We won't go any further with him right now, but not long after he left, uh, World War I began. And I want to introduce you to a new person around World War I who was hired by the government to do what Charles Bernays, so the person we're talking about is Edward Bernays, sorry, Edward Bernays called psychological warfare. Edward Bernays, to orient you to him, he is the nephew of Sigmund Freud. His mother was Sigmund Freud's daughter, and he was deeply influenced by Freud's work. The U.S. government hired him to be a part of the Committee of Public Public Information. And after four years of working with CPI, Edward Bernays had this to say about his work there. There was one basic lesson I learned on the CPI, that efforts to affect the attitudes of the enemy and people of this country could be applied with equal facility to peacetime pursuits. In other words, what could be done for a nation at war could be done for organizations and people in a nation at peace. By his own explanation, what he was doing during the war was psychological warfare. And what he's saying in this quote is that we can do the same thing at peacetime. Instead of focusing on people that aren't a part of America, we can focus it on our people and influence them in just the same way. A couple couple years later, he wrote this to describe more of the process of what he was about. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. It's hard to overstate exactly what he is proposing and doing in this quotation. With that insight, Bernays and others intended to bring big change to America. And the change in strategy was a move from meeting needs to creating them. At that time, it's difficult to see what was happening because coming out of World War I, America was learning that they could manufacture and produce on amazing scales. 
And now that they were able to do that with war, they began to do that with other industries. The American way is something that Bernays created. It was a marketing campaign. The American way is a marketing campaign. And from 10 years, from 1919 to 1929, America changed significantly. Consider this, in 1919, just out of World War, World War I, the average American home used gas lights and candles. They had horses for transportation. Just 10 years later, 1929, electricity and cars dominated the landscape. In addition to most American homes had refrigerators, toasters, washing machines, radios, curling irons, and even popcorn poppers were becoming commonplace. Ten years. And perhaps the best way to sum up Bernays' philosophy, this gospel of consumption, is what we have can never be enough. What we have can never, ever be enough. Now, we can't give all the blame or all the credit to Bernays because he didn't do it alone, although he was the undisputed leader of the movement. But there were others who were on board and influencing the nation along these lines. And one of them was a banker named Paul Mazur of the Lehman Brothers. And he described in 1927, he described it this way. He said, we must shift America from a a needs culture to a desires culture. People must be trained to want new things even before the old have been entirely consumed. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. We see that. Right? How many iPhones come out every year? Right? We need a new iPhone, not because our old one works, you know, worse than it did when we got it, but because there's a new one. Because we've been trained, intentionally trained, to desire things before the old have been entirely consumed. And what this move really was, was a move from citizenship to consumerism. From being a citizen to being a consumer. And the change in strategy from meeting needs to creating them. Let's go back to Charles Kettering. 20 years have elapsed since, we've, since we heard about him. And remember what he was looking at at the sales department and NCR every day for five years. We cannot afford to have even a single dissatisfied customer. In 1929, he wrote an article called Keep the Customer Dissatisfied. And in that article, he says this, The only reason for research is to keep your customers reasonably dissatisfied with what they already have. If everyone were satisfied, no one would buy the new things because no one would want it. 20 years, cultural influence on a man who was committed to not having any dissatisfaction in customers, to now being committed and being a spokesperson and really bringing definition around the ideas that Bernays and others were unfolding into the culture, the power of culture around us. But as I was learning about all this, I asked myself the question, why? Why? Why did they want this? And what I learned was really, really interesting to me, and it goes back to that idea of production. So they realized, and Labor Secretary in 1927, James Davis, said that the textile mills of the country could produce all the cloth needed in only six months' operation. They also realized that out of all the shoe factories, they only needed 14% of them to make all the shoes needed for a year. And so there's this big problem of not having enough work for people to do. And so there was a debate about what should we do? And there were some companies that proposed, you know what we should do is just have a 30-hour work week, six hours a day, same pay, same benefits. Doesn't that sound terrible? That's terrible, right? We wouldn't want less work. And actually, Charles Kellogg, or not Charles Kellogg, I forget his first name, Kellogg, you know, the Kellogg company, they actually did that for a period of time. 30-hour work week, same pay, and it was fine, worked great. But here was the fear that happened. The fear was that if we have too much free time, then we'll become unhappy. 
and unhappiness breeds radicalism. So this is a quote from John Edgerton, president of National American Manufacturers Association, says it this way, nothing breeds radicalism more than unhappiness, unless it's leisure. And so these leaders thought, well, we can't have that, so we got to keep people busy. And if we're going to keep people busy making things we don't need, then we have to figure out how to way to get them to want what they don't need. Culture of consumerism. What happened on October, 9, October 29, 1929? What happened? Anybody? Was anybody here at that time? B- Bill, were you around? <laughs> anybody? Bill and I are friends. It's a joke. He's no longer my boss as of a month ago. We can have this joking now. Um, Black Tuesday, right? The crash of the stock market. And so when this happened, so this was right in the midst of all these things I'm telling you about. When this happened, there was a push by a lot of average people. We got to stop this. We got to stop living beyond our means, buying things that we don't really need. And there is a movement throughout our culture towards a return to that. But Hoover and his administration, this quote's after um, Black Tuesday, say this, by advertising and other means, we have found a boundless field before us that there are new wants which will make way endlessly for fewer wants as soon as they are satisfied. And so his solution to to the Depression was more of the same. Now FDR came in with the New Deal and returned Uh, a vision of people being citizens rather than consumers. And we don't have time this morning to go into the ideological battle that happened. But what we do know is which side won. To wrap up on Charles Kettering, he, he invented many things, had 186 patents, uh, the electric starter. Anybody has a car so you don't have to crank it? Part of his work. But the reason I grew up hearing about Charles Kettering is because my mom was raised, born and raised in Kettering, Ohio. And so he is a cultural hero. They has six schools named after him. And I'm not trying to suggest that he didn't do anything good for our culture because he clearly did. But the other parts of what he did was he moved us towards an ideology of consumption. Now, with that historical backdrop, I want us to look a little bit more at the details of what are we talking about when we're talking about consumerism and consumers and what are the tenants and so we're going to go through that if there's a if you look in the middle of your table there's a handout and so I'm going to talk with you first a consumer what is a consumer a consumer is someone who has surrendered to other people or institutions the power to provide what is essential for a full and satisfied life That's on your handout. A consumer is one who has surrendered to other people or institutions the power to provide what is essential for a full and satisfied life. Now, as followers of Christ, we know who we should surrender to to have a full and satisfied life. But the culture is bombarding us with messages every day that we don't have what we need and what we... To get what we need, we need to turn to places other than God. Three tenets of consumerism. The first one, satisfaction can be purchased. Satisfaction can be purchased. And so again, we don't have what we need, though Scripture tells us that we do. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. But our culture is telling us we don't. We must become a consumer because satisfaction is available for purchase. If we believe it, And most of us do either consciously or unconsciously believe that we don't have what we need. And that makes money the predominant value in society, doesn't it? If satisfaction is available for purchase and I want satisfaction, I need to have money so that I can play the game and get satisfaction. First tenet, satisfaction can be purchased. Second tenet of consumerism Purchasing power is found in institutions and systems. Purchasing power is found in institutions and systems. 
From our birth, we are groomed for a system life. We're born into an institution called a hospital. We're given a number called a social security number. And all the way through, we go into schools, right? We're groomed for system life, institutional life. Systems provide consistency and control, as well as safety and scale. I'm not here saying systems are bad, but what I want us to look at is when we think about systems and institutions, how does that interact with consumerism? And what are the good things about systems? And what are the things about systems and institutions that maybe aren't so great? Since the needs of the masses are met by institutions, we must work within them to get the money we need to purchase the satisfaction we're looking for. Since the needs of the masses are met by the institutions, most must work in them to get that money. Because again, money is the ultimate value in a consumeristic society. The system way, whether it's health, psychology, education, horticulture, childcare, etc., is to elementalize, curricularize, and manage. It's a system way. So elementalize, so I didn't, wasn't familiar with that word, uh, means to break it down into simplified components. Make it into a curriculum and then manage it. That's the system way. The third tenet of consumerism. Life in institutions demands our identity. Life in institutions demands our identity. Because to institutionalize means that we must depersonalize. When you're working within institutions, you're there for your skills. Check your individual personality, opinions at the door. We don't have any need for those. And we don't have any need for relationships here either. We're here to produce. They demand our identity. And we become known by what we do, not who we are. Because competence trumps character. And uniformity trumps uniqueness in a system world. What's the result? So if we look at those three, first one, satisfaction can be purchased. Purchasing power is found in institutions and systems. Life in institutions demands our identity. The result is boredom. Boredom is a result of living in a consumer world. The cure is entertainment and consumption. This means that I have become sedentary and passive, and the competence to be with myself has disappeared. I do not know how to love my world and have it be enough. When I say I am bored, the truth is I have become boring. And this is reinforced by the system world's demand for repetition and predictability. Think about it. All this leisure time that we just wish we would have had more of, 30-hour work week instead of 40, what would we do with it? What do you do with your leisure time now? If you're an average American, you consume. Consume media, you know, whether it's movies, television, music. And we buy experiences. That's how we spend free time. Very, very few people in an institutional consumeristic society produce in their free time. Create in their free time. Very, very few. (coughs) Boredom is the result of living in a system world because the competence to be with ourselves, to have the world be enough, we don't have it anymore. It'd be easy to have a workshop on each one of these tenets. Okay? So I understand that I'm coming at you with big ideas and big concepts that really literally impact virtually every aspect of our life. But I want to move forward to expectations in a consumeristic culture. Another way to say this is what do I expect to get in a culture of consumerism? There are at least three. The first one is, 
I expect to get what I want now. I expect to get what I want now. Poster child for this? McDonald's. The first ones to figure out how do we get people food now so they don't have to wait 15 or 20 minutes. And that's how they became McDonald's. That's how they grew so fast, right? Second expectation, I expect to get what I want my way. I heard it already. Burger King. Now, I didn't want to picture Burger King because that's boring. So this, this guy, I have an 18-month-old son, month old son at home, and he's like this. I know this is not Burger King, but I will have it my way. He doesn't say that in words, but he says it in lots of other ways. <laughs> but we expect that. I expect to get what I want my way. Third expectation is I expect to get, if I don't want what I thought I wanted, I expect to be able to return what I don't want after all and try again at no penalty to me. At no cost to me. I expect to be able to return what I don't want after all and try again. And we do it all the time at Walmart. And many other places. So three expectations. I expect to get what I want now. I expect to get what I want my way. And if, after all, I really didn't want that, after all, I expect to be able to return it and not have any consequence at no cost to me. Life in a consumeristic society. Next thing we're going to do is move forward and we're going to have a large group discussion. But before we do that, are there any clarifying questions? So I'm not asking broadly, do you have any questions anywhere? Clarifying questions about what I've shared. So let's talk together about how you have seen consumerism impact your church's culture and or your church's leadership. We pay the staff to do that. Okay, yes. So we pay the experts, right? And so we're using our money to get them to do what needs to be done. So there's no need for us to do it. Excellent. Okay, yeah. We have started to treat people like things to return it to try again. Yes, good. So we are treating people like things. And, you know, if we're not happy with them, then, you know, we can mix and match, exchange, find somebody else to do the job. Good. Yep. I would say two things. Again, with the experts. Good. So the first was that idea of letting the professionals do the work and absconding our responsibility. And the second is trying to get the biggest and the best lighting system, sound system, or whatever to draw people in. Yes. Great. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So we don't have, so the question, I'm always repeating, the question is, uh, what does it mean to have confidence to be with yourself in light of the ideas of, fill in that gap? Uh, a cultural message is to believe in yourself. Cultural message to believe in yourself. So I would answer that this way. We don't have confidence to be with only ourselves because we are uncomfortable with who we are, we're bored with who we are, And the way it manifests itself is we always have to be doing and engaged by something, right? So we have to, uh, instead of just sitting and waiting, if you're waiting on something, we have to have our phone out. We have to be listening to something. We have to be watching something. How often does anyone in our culture anymore just sit and think? To stop, you know, I'm just going to take some time and just think and just tune in to what's going on up here. And we've lost that. I have a different take on what he said. Sure. Yep. Um, the other thing, I am who I am. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's the opposite of that too sometimes. Okay. Yep. So it could be the opposite where they just say, well, it's just who I am. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Other questions, or not questions, other insights on how this is impacting the church and church's leadership. Yeah, Chris. How they can take it and use it wherever they want to. Absolutely. Yeah. So the people that we're trying to minister to are living in this consumeristic society and they're looking for the best children's program, the best preaching, the best music. And that puts a pressure on the leaders, right? 
Well, if you're not delivering that, I'll go to the church down the street. That's fine. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So religion becomes a product to be consumed rather than a lifestyle. Yeah. One more. Okay. Yep. So it impacts our churches financially because we're spending all this money on stuff we just want and don't need, and we're not committed to giving money into the church. Yeah. Okay. We need to move on. I know there's lots more. Um, What we're going to do now is move into small groups at your tables. Okay. So again, I believe that you guys have lots of insights. And before we do that, here are the ones I came up with. Thanks, Roy. Um, A lot of them you guys have talked about already. Lay people become marginalized in favor of the experts. So sometimes it is, you know, the lay people are saying, well, yeah, it's not my job. But other times as ministry professionals, we can say, well, you better let us handle this, right? We got the training and you guys really don't know. Um, Second thing, religious activity and products are elevated over relationships. And so we begin to think, well, If I can just get the next best curriculum, then my church is going to be changed. If I can just become a better preacher, then that's really going to be what changes people and changes our culture. Third, loss of vision for training and developing individuals and uh, for personal ministry. Billy Graham said, The first great reformation gave the word of God into the hands of the people. The next great reformation will put ministry into the hands of the people. And I love that quote, right? Because that is what we're to be about and we're to be doing as we're discipling people. Lastly, lay people feel helplessness inside the church and harassed by life outside the church. So helplessness inside the church because they don't feel equipped to be able to do the ministry that the professionals are doing. Well, why should I do that when we got you guys? Right? I could try, but I could never do it as well as you. Harassed by life outside the church because of boredom, because of frustration with life, because of losing their sense of identity and what God, so they hear a message in church about purpose and what God is calling us to, and then they engage with their day-to-day life, which feels so different for them. So those are the ones that I came up with. Tell me more. Okay, so he's saying maybe it should be reversed, harassed by people inside the church and helpless outside. I could see it both ways. I see it both ways. All right, so around your tables, I want you to interact over these questions. And we're going to have about seven or eight minutes to do this, okay? How does consumerism impact life-on-life disciple-making? How does it impact developing a culture of disciple-making? Okay, so in light of the things that you've heard, the things that we've talked about, what are the things that come into your mind or maybe that you've experienced that you can see the impact of these cultural forces on disciple making in the church? Okay, go. You've been listening to the Disciple Makers podcast. That message was from Navigator Church Ministries track called Crockpot Church Cultures in a Microwave World at the National Disciple Making Forum. 